Now I'd like to hand it over to our Congresswoman and Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Thank you very much, Dan, uh, for putting us in, in line to have a discussion this evening about our commitment uh, to our city. Thank you for your service as well as Chair of the Health Commission for the city, and I know you'll be a resource for us this evening as well. It is an honor to join San Franciscans for our town hall. Thank you to all of our participants. I'm very happy this evening to welcome my colleague from across the bay, Congressman Jared Hoffman, a climate champion and a leading force in Democrats' work to build back better, bring a firm focus on justice and the future. He has been a leader on the environment, a look-to person in the Congress, and I'm honored he's with us this evening. And with us also is Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, California Surgeon General, whose science-based leadership and focus on equity has helped our state lead the way to crush, crushing the virus. I thank her for her California leadership as well as Governor Newsom. And as always, I salute our Mayor London Breed, who has been outstanding as we fight the pandemic and to build back better. My colleague, my friends, uh, my constituents, I call you my bosses. Uh, I wanted to report to you on some legislation that has passed in the Congress in the last couple of weeks. So first is, uh, was the BIF, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Legislation, which goes a long way to creating uh, good paying jobs, uh, building the infrastructure of our country uh, in a way uh, that is better. Again, you know, building back better. President, the president has said that he wants to find as much bipartisan agreement as he could on the bi on the infrastructure bill, roads, bridges, etc. But he would not confine his vision to just that. It had to be built back better. So, in addition to passing the infrastructure bill, we also passed the B, the the Build Back Better bill, which again builds back better in a green way. Uh, builds back better in a transformative way by making way for women in the workplace with early uh, early child well universal pre K and child care, uh, family and medical leave uh, issues that relate to the president's child tax credit, sending a check every month to families with children, little children, as well as uh, to have home health care enabling moms, dads, people with responsibilities at home to be in the workplace with the comfort of knowing that their loved ones at home are cared for who need health care. And it also is with respect for the health care workers so that they are treated with respect, paid uh, appropriately, and again, contributing uh, to the transformative nature of this legislation. Again, it has the biggest a biggest investment in addressing the climate crisis, a half a trillion dollars in many different ways. And Mr. Hoffman will address some of them uh, in his remarks and we can respond in questions, but it involves tax credits and, and uh, investments in, again, protecting our planet for future generations. It's our moral responsibility to do so. In addition to those two elements, is there initiative on health care that is in there, broadening and strengthening the Affordable Care Act, so it includes millions more people at lower cost and higher quality, and does so by uh, including in all of this the um, those who have been left out in their states by states not expanding Medicaid, but embracing them in the Affordable Care Act. It also enables us to at least start on our negotiations for lower prices for prescription drugs, and that will lower costs for people, also for the taxpayer, and again, uh, helps to offset the, in my view, unfair uh, nature of pharma as they have treated uh, uh, domestic consumers in a different way than those overseas. So for these and other reasons, this legislation, the Build Back Better, does exactly that, builds back with equity, with fairness, with respect for communities, doing so in a way that uh, combined with the, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure bill has a 40% equity uh, uh, requirement in it that we're doing things uh, that help 
com- communities, not divides them. And so it's a, it's a time, oh, this week is something. Yesterday we had World AIDS Day. Tomorrow is the International Day uh, of for Persons with Disabilities. And both of those communities are benefiting from what we're doing in the Build Back Better legislation. And again, uh, last week we saw, we observed Thanksgiving in San Francisco, our, um, our beautiful day of inter, of, of interfaith Thanksgiving breakfast where we, well, we didn't have breakfast, we had prayers, but it was a breakfast time where we honored Rita Semmel for her 100th birthday and her tremendous leadership in our community. So uh, connecting back home with our San Francisco values reflected in our legislation in Congress. It's been a very eventful couple of weeks and there's more to come. Uh, I look forward to hearing your questions and your responses to our questions. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, it has been, it's my pleasure now and I'm honored to yield to a public health hero, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, a pioneer in studying and prioritizing youth health and toxic stress, a leading voice in addressing health disparities and an absolute force in our state's work to crush the coronavirus. She's an intellectual resource for us globally, nationally, locally, and personally. Thank you very much for joining us, honoring us with your presence, informing us with your wisdom. Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris. And before we hear from the Surgeon General, for those of you who just joined and have a question for any of the speakers, just press zero on your phone keypad now to be added to the queue. We will try to answer as many questions as possible. Dr. Burke-Harris. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to join you today. My uh, deep thanks to Speaker Pelosi for that very kind introduction. And as as I begin, I want to just start by speaking to the issue that may be top of mind for many of you, uh, and that is the discovery of the Omicron variant in San Francisco, the first case of Omicron in the United States. Uh, Subsequently, we've now confirmed five cases in New York, um, as well as one case in Hawaii. So uh, the arrival of the Omicron variant in the United States, and, you know, many folks are asking me what can and should we be doing. And the five things that are critically important that we can be doing right now, getting vaccinated, and uh, if it's been six months since your Moderna or Pfizer vaccine or two months since your Johnson & Johnson, go ahead and get that booster. Wear a mask when indoors, regardless of vaccination status. Get tested if you are having symptoms. Stay home if you're sick and follow the CDC's guidance about travel. And really that is, uh, it, there's, there's really nowhere that's more prepared to deal with Uh, COVID, and when we look at California's COVID response, we've really been a national leader. And so as we look forward, this is something that I think we can continue to double down. Californians have been excellent in our uh, response to the pandemic. And uh, we know that the pandemic has been an incredibly stressful time for all of us, but especially our children uh, and families. Children have experienced uh, social isolation, lost caregivers, and uh, many of us have experienced worsened mental health. Just recently, the American Academy of Pediatrics declared a state of emergency for children and youth mental health. And that is why safe, stable, and supportive relationships for children have never been more important. So support systems like access to free, high-quality, universal preschool for three- and four-year-olds, at this point, it's not just necessary, it's vital. We know that preschool improves our children's brain development and their cognitive functioning, and it also enables our child care workers to be that additional source of nurturing, buffering care and support during this challenging time. That is easing the burden for our parents and caregivers and also being that, uh, that healing presence for our kids. We also know that the economic impacts of the pandemic have been and continue to be a huge stressor 
for so many California families. And so when we look at universal paid leave for parents, tax cuts for families with children, lowering the cost of child care, all of these things ensure that parents and caregivers can keep their jobs and not have to make the impossible choice between economic well-being and their child's well-being. And that is something that California is taking a lead role in, is investing in our future. California has invested more than $4 billion in the new Children and Youth Behavioral Health Initiative to ensure that all children receive the, the screening, the support, and the evidence-based care for emerging and existing behavioral health needs. These investments make a difference. And California's ability to lead in this area has been really enabled by strong federal partnerships and support. And now is the moment for us to act. This work has never been more important. And with that, I'm just, I want to express my gratitude to Speaker Pelosi and to our federal partners who uh, really highlight how we can seize this moment to not just get back to, to where we were before, but truly to build back better. Thank you, Dr. Burke-Harris. Before, before we move forward, I'll offer the results of our first poll question. The first poll question, would an extension of the Biden tax credit for families with children from the American Rescue Plan have a positive impact on you and your family? 40 percent, um, sorry, 48 percent said yes, and 52 percent said no. Our next question, do you think the U.S. should reduce its dependence on fossil fuels and invest in clean energy solutions to combat climate change? Press 1 for yes and press 2 for no. Um, now I will hand it back over to Congresswoman Pelosi. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dan, and I uh, thank Dr. Burke Harris for her uh, wonderful presentation, uh, the leadership role that California is playing in all of this, as well as her recognition of the federal role and the Build Back Better with our commitment to universal pre-K and, and child care and child tax credit and family medical leave and home health care and the rest. It is transformative, and it is parents Children learning, parents earning, that's a good thing. And it's all, uh, there's so many other things that I'll address as we go along. But next, we're going to hear from our champion on the environment, uh, uh, Congressman Jared Hoffman. I had the privilege of being in the delegation with uh, Congressman Hoffman as we went to Scotland for COP26, where we pledged to meet and beat our pollution goals and defeat the climate crisis. As we were there, he was an intellectual resource, not only to our large 22-member uh, delegation uh, from the House, but also to others uh, from around the world who had come together. In our Congress, in the Build Back Better, as I said, we have a half a trillion dollars invested in protecting uh, the climate and uh, in large measure due to some of the advocacy and leadership uh, of our my distinguished colleague from across the Bay, Congressman Jared Hoffman. Thank you, Congressman Hoffman, for your leadership and for being with us this evening. Thank you so much, Speaker Pelosi. It is an honor to join you and Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris in this telephone town hall tonight. And folks, as the speaker just described, the Build Back Better Act uh, is a very unique opportunity for this country to take some huge steps forward, delivering affordable health care, uh, better better health care coverage, better access, uh, child care, housing, good paying jobs, and a lot more than that. Uh, these things are not only going to help people get back to work next year, they're going to position our economy for success for many, many years to come, for the long haul. And as important as all these things are, uh, I do want to say that I believe the most consequential thing in this bill is that it includes major investments to combat the climate crisis, the largest investments the world has ever seen in this space. And that comes after decades of debate and half measures and band-aids 
all happening as the climate crisis just continued to worsen. So after all of that, uh, I am so excited to share some good news for a change on climate action. Everybody's probably heard about the bipartisan infrastructure deal that President Biden signed into law last month. Speaker Pelosi described that as well. It's a bill that focuses mostly on traditional infrastructure, very important stuff. But it also has some foundational investments, which if we pass the Build Back Better Act, these things can help us tackle the climate crisis, like critical updates to the energy grid, a record investment in public transit, and a down payment on creating a national electric vehicle charging network. The Build Back Better Act, though, is what unlocks the positive climate potential of those traditional infrastructure investments. It provides incentives to decarbonize our power sector so that that more modern, resilient grid we're going to have will be moving clean electricity all over this country within the next decade or so. And it helps dramatically improve the affordability and the availability of all types of electric vehicles. This is critical because transportation is now the highest emitting sector in our economy when it comes to carbon pollution. So we're in a race against time with this climate crisis, but with the Build Back Better Act having cleared the House last month and being poised for passage out of the Senate this month, we hope, we are closer than ever to actually producing climate action that finally matches the scale and the urgency of this global crisis. And in doing that, we will create millions of great jobs and help position the United States as the global leader on clean energy and climate solutions in the 21st century. So that is why I'm so excited about this bill. Now, Speaker Pelosi told you that I uh, was privileged to join her in the congressional delegation at the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow last month. I want to just say that from that experience, it became very clear to me that passing the Build Back Better Act is going to have a profound positive impact well beyond our own borders. The world is watching our country right now very closely. A, a bunch of other countries have been holding back, frankly, their own climate reforms until they see if the United States has a serious commitment to climate action and in, until they see whether that's here to stay. So passing the Build Back Better Act right now is the single most important thing that we can do to jumpstart the kind of global climate action we need to resolve this crisis. And when we talk about the climate pieces of this bill, uh, I just want to emphasize that over one-third of this bill's $1.7 trillion in investments is reserved for investments to boost clean energy and combat climate change over the next decade. That, again, is the largest climate investment the world has ever seen. And in addition to those investments I mentioned for clean power and clean transportation, it includes major investments in more energy-efficient buildings, climate-friendly agriculture, a federal green bank, and a new civilian climate core. Uh, the goal of this package, of course, is to reduce U.S. carbon emissions by 50% below 2005 levels by the end of this decade. As we heard in Glasgow, this is the key decade. Uh, the, the emission reduction targets we've set for this decade will determine whether we can keep global warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's critical to preserving a, a livable planet for future generations. The bill also includes critical climate provisions that I've personally helped develop and shepherd through the process, an end to fossil fuel leasing in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, an end to new offshore drilling in federal waters along the Atlantic and Pacific coast and the eastern Gulf of Mexico, $6 billion to transform the largest civilian fleet in the world, the United States Postal Service fleet, and put EV charging infrastructure in every single postal facility in America. I'm very excited about that. $27 billion in investments for forestry programs to combat forest fires and promote resilient, healthy forests, including $500 million for wildfire management, a billion dollars for Pacific salmon restoration and conservation. And because I represent a lot of Indian country in my North Coast district, I'm really pleased by the tribal set-asides in this legislation, including a number of investments for uh, Indian health services, construction of facilities, uh, and also $500 million for tribal and native Hawaiian climate resilience and adaptation. And I'll just mention also $490 million for tribal public safety and justice and $25 million for emergency drought relief for tribes. 
So all of this uh, tells you why I'm so excited about passing this legislation, excited that we passed it out of the House just before Thanksgiving, and excited that we are on the precipice, I think, this month of, of passing it through the United States Senate and getting it to President Biden's desk. I look forward to joining the conversations, responding to as many questions as we can, and uh, thank you again, Speaker Pelosi, for including me this evening. Thank you, Congressman Huffman. Before we open to questions and answers from all of you, um, we do have the results of our second poll question. That question, do you think the U.S. should reduce its dependence on fossil fuels and invest in clean energy solutions to combat climate change? 92% uh, of you answered yes, and 8% of you answered no. Now we will move into questions from our listeners. Our first question is from Judy. Judy, you are on the live line to pose your question. Yes, this is Judy, and I'm in Brook Trail, California. And Nancy, that's about three hours north of San Francisco on Highway 101. We live in beautiful country up here. But, you know, um, one thing I have a question about with this by the BBB, how is it going to affect senior citizens? I'm 75, I'm disabled, and will we be getting extra money? Now, I know that my extended families up here have received the child care money, and uh, quite a bit of it, actually. And each one of those families are successful as far as making money, but what are you going to do for senior citizens? Well, senior citizens are a very uh, top priority for us as Democrats, and that's why we have fought to uh, uh, strengthen Medicare and, again, Medicaid, which many seniors have long-term health care uh, uh, provided for by that, and that's part of what is in this legislation to expand that uh, opportunity to 12 more states. But specifically to all of our seniors, uh, we have provisions in the legislation that affect uh, benefits for seniors, including hearing, a hearing benefit to expand benefits. Our, our purpose was to uh, negotiate for lower drug prices so that we could reduce the cost of prescription drugs to all of our uh, people, but especially to our seniors, to put a cap on what they would be um, uh, required to, not required, but would not have to spend more than $2,000 in a year. Uh, that may sound like a lot of money, but it's a lot less than what uh, the uh, marketplace is now. So reducing the cost of prescription drugs, expanding benefits to include hearing, and this is a really important initiative, uh, uh, from, and expanding the opportunity for long-term health care to places do not have access to that. A very important part of our home health care uh, a provision in the bill is $150 billion for home health care. Many people, uh, women and men, largely women, are caregivers. So they are, um, uh, in order for them to work, it is necessary for them to have home health care, largely for seniors, sometimes for a sibling with a disability, sometimes with children, but largely this is for care for our seniors. So seniors do very well uh, in the legislation, in addition to some things that are, are broader in terms of uh, 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 making affordable housing, home ownership, community development, issues of quality of life where people live. But directly money in the pocket relates to the cost of prescription drugs, uh, the ability to have home health care paid for, paid for, as well as family and medical leave, family leave, but again, that's more across the board. The home health care uh, is um, uh, uh, largely for seniors. So, and, and again, the hearing. Now, that's just a start for us. We want to also have vision and dental, and that we have gone down the path by making the uh, pharmaceutical companies engage in prescription drug negotiations. The more we can get them to do that, the more we can expand the Medicare benefits. So thank you, Congresswoman Pelosi. And on this topic, um, we can move on to our next poll question, 
which is, do you support allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices to lower the cost of prescription drugs to ensure that life-saving medications are available to all communities and people? Press 1 for yes and press 2 for no. Our next call is, our next uh, question is from Ryan in Bernal Heights. Ryan, you are on the live line to pose your question. Yeah, so I'm wondering with this new variant and its resilience to the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, what steps, I mean, what what are you guys planning to do about that? Um, so I'm happy to respond to that question. And we expect to learn more about Omicron in the coming weeks. So we're really looking at the data, and we want to look at the science. Um, but in, in the meantime, our focus is on the protection and prevention strategies that we know have been effective. And we really want to make sure that uh, as we are responding to Omicron, that we're doing that based on the science and the data. And at this point, our, our, our strongest line of defense is with making sure that we're vaccinated, wearing masks indoors, uh, and, and practicing those public health measures that we know work. I just would like to add to that, and I thank Dr. Burke Harris for her uh, informed uh, answer to that. Uh, this, uh, the, the president released a, a White House uh, Omicron uh, Talk, uh, program today where he talked about the new variant is a cause for concern but not panic. We'll fight this fight variant, as Dr. Burke Harris said, with science and not chaos and confusion. The breast protection of this Omicron is getting fully vaccinated and getting a booster shot. All adults are currently eligible for a booster and at no cost. Uh, we are more prepared for Omicron than any prior variant with over 72% of adults in the country, 15 million adolescents, 4 million 4 to 11-year-olds 11 11 vaccinated. But, uh, again, as the doctor said, uh, we're waiting. We have another week to see how the variants will be, um, uh, how the vaccines will respond to this variant. Uh, but we are, are very optimistic and careful and prepared as we go forward, and we want again to share that information with other with other countries. But this was a plan that was announced uh, by the president since yesterday. Great. Thank you, Congresswoman, and thank you, Ryan, for that question. Thank you also to Dr. Burke Harris. Our next question is from John in Civic Center. John, you are on the live line to pose your question. <laughs> Yeah, hello, Nancy. This is John Fiore from, uh, I live on 10th and Market, and I've been in San Francisco for seven years, originally from Minneapolis. But the um, question I have uh, regarding the Build Back Better plan is, does it include funding strategies to help with uh, the homeless situation, you know, whether it's housing or health issues or, you know, that matter? So I was that's my question. Is does, are there funding there to help with the housing, health issues of homeless? Yes, there people? is. Yes, there is. Um, and I thank you, uh, Ryan, for your question. Uh, there's $150 billion in the legislation in order to uh, provide uh, affordable housing, and some of it going directly to address the homeless issue. Uh, our goal, of course, is to have uh, people. Uh, have access we have to increase the housing stock as well uh, and that is that a good deal of the money in the bill does that it also has a uh, section 8 vouchers that Maxine Waters the chair of the committee was very um, uh, uh, insistent on having in the legislation uh, her um, vision about ending homelessness in the Amer in the, in our country uh, is manifested in many aspects of the $150 billion, the largest, this is the money that is unprecedented in terms of 
of um, of it. Now it's not the end of it. We'll have our appropriations bill that we're working on, where we will go uh, further in that. But this legislation has already passed the House, will pass the Senate, and will be quickly uh, available to communities. Uh, we are also working with money in the Veterans Committee, the Veterans Affairs Committee. That's five billion dollars uh, to meet the, our veterans' needs. Some of that to address our homeless vets as well. Uh, but in many of the different categories, uh, there is a opportunity for us to have affordability, but also to increase increase the um, uh, pay of, of people so that they can afford their housing as well. So again, it has a comprehensive approach to it in every way. Uh, for the big commitment of money, a uh, way to increase income for people and also paid for by making the wealthy and corporate America pay their fair share. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, and thank you to John. Our next question comes from Kent in the Marina. Kent, you are on the live line to pose your question. Hi there, Speaker Pelosi. Uh, I wanted to pose a question around commercial electric vehicle manufacturers and the support for the, the EV industry on the commercial side that's in the Build, Build Back Better plan. Uh, I was curious if you could highlight some of the, the key things that have been put in there. I, I want to be very happy to yield to Mr. Huffman on this score because I what I didn't say before about him is that he is a member of the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, uh, that he is a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and he is also a, a, a leader on the um, Natural Resources Committee, all of which are weighing in on this uh, electrification issue. Mr. Ho uh, Congressman Hoffman? Thank you, Speaker Pelosi and Kent. Thanks for that great question. Um, you know, if we're going to hit this goal of 50% uh, reduced emissions by the end of this decade, we've got to very quickly transform the transportation sector. So your question about electric vehicles uh, and electric vehicle charging um, is right at the heart of that. What this legislation does is uh, builds on uh, the $7.5 billion uh, that was provided in the bipartisan infrastructure bill for EV charging and takes that much further through the tax code primarily with new tax credits and incentives for um, not just the deployment of EV charging systems all over this country. I mentioned the $6 billion that will go to the Postal Service for both electric uh, fleet vehicles, but also uh, the charging infrastructure needed for those vehicles and for everyone who visits a postal facility everywhere in the country. That's a big deal for the success of, of EVs. Um, but then to make it available to consumers, and uh, we're, we're significantly expanding the uh, tax credits right now. When you go to buy an EV, you can get up to 7500 uh, uh, but there are caps on that for certain manufacturers, and that's really as far as it goes. So if we can pass Build Back Better, and especially if you can get an EV that's made here in the United States using union labor, that tax credit can go all the way up you know, north of $12,000, and you can begin to see how EVs um, will pretty quickly uh, pencil out for more and more Americans. So uh, I'm truly excited about it. Uh, there's some other clean vehicle incentives in this for uh, electric and zero emission buses and for uh, other fleets. But I, I think those are the main ones that I would uh, offer in response to your question. Thank you, Congressman Huffman, and thank you to Kent for his question. Our next question comes from, I believe it is Leslie in San Francisco. Uh, you are on the live line to pose your question. Yes, thank you, um, and Madam Speaker and all of you, thank you for what you do every day. Um, my question refers to pre-K and child care and the other end of it. I'd love some clarification on the funding for the, the teachers and the child care workers. Um, they're just not, a, they're, they're not enough right now, and I'd like to know more about the living wage and 
how you, how, what the plan is to recruit and then train them. Um, thank you. Well, thank you so much for your question because it reaches to the heart of the matter. It's not, it is of course important uh, to have uh, trained teachers as well as uh, to pay them uh, respectful of their contribution that they make as custodians of our children. But we also have in the legislation uh, initiatives to help, and, and not just this bill, but what we started with the rescue package in March and um, and now in the legislation they, uh, that is current uh, in this month, and that is to uh, for school construction as well. We tell children that that they are um, uh, that they are that education is important, and some of them go to schools that are totally inadequate uh, to the task. So it is um, uh, we have something in here that has a grow your own uh, in, to investing in our K through 12 teachers. The bill invests nearly 650 million uh, in addressing the nationwide teacher shortage by funding efforts to recruit and train educators with a particular emphasis on educators from underrepresented backgrounds, including it has initiatives to grow your own program, provides roughly $112 million for grants to eligible partnerships for the purpose of grow your own programs that address shortages of teachers in high-need sub uh, subjects, shortages of school teachers in high-need schools, and low diversity within the teacher and school uh, leader workforce. It has teacher residencies, provides roughly $112 million to award grants to eligible partnerships for the development and support of high-quality teacher residency programs. Support school participants, provides roughly $112 million to award grants for the development and support of school leadership programs. It goes on and provides $112 million for the Gus Hawkins Centers for Excellence Program Awards to support teacher preparation programs in historically black colleges and universities. Now that's not the pre-K, I understand. And then again, a funding for individuals with disabilities education act uh, that, uh, that has $160 million for that. And again, grants for Native American language teachers in education. As Mr. Um, Mr. Huffman mentioned, uh, our focus on Native American populations, whether across the country, even including in Hawaii, is, is very central to what we are doing. Uh, but again, whether it's school construction, teacher training, or uh, just adequate funding uh, for universal pre-K and child care, uh, the child care uh, people need a guidance and training and adequate pay as well. So it's about placing a value on those who are the custodians of our children in, in every way possible. And, and by the way, I want to just say that when we did the uh, rescue package in March, uh, I had a very heavy emphasis on state and local uh, grants, money to state and local government, so that the money would be there for education, transportation, providing health care, all the kinds of things that state and local government delivers on. Because of the pandemic, many teachers were being fired because state and local governments were exhausting their resources by the cost of the pandemic as well as the loss of revenue uh, from the tax base not being there for people not going out buying things, having dinner, paying taxes, and the rest. So it was very important to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars for us to make sure that every any community in the country, be a small town or a county, of course cities and states, would have the resources they need uh, to meet the needs of their people, education being a very essential part of all of that. This that we're doing in these bills are additional to that. But it all adds up to hundreds of billions of dollars paid for by making the wealthy and corporate America pay their fair share for the children. Thank you, Congresswoman, and thank you, Leslie. Our next question is from Patrick. Patrick, you are on the live line to pose your question. 
Well, first, thank you very much to all of our speakers for the great work you've done in, in the last year. It's, it's appreciated. And also, thank you for the good update tonight. A quick suggestion before my question. You've done so much great work in the first year, but we're losing the public relations war. You really need to get out there and educate the public um, on all the great things that you're doing. Now for my question, my single greatest concern is the potential for our democratic form of government to fall to an authoritarian regime. And I want to know what Congress is doing to ensure that does not happen. And two, what can I do as an individual to ensure that does not happen? Because if it does, all the great things you've been talking about tonight will be moot. Thank you for taking Thank you, Patrick. I, I would like to uh, invite our guests to uh, respond to your question as well, but let me begin by saying you're absolutely right. This is a, our time. The time has found us to protect the democracy that our founders established, that Lincoln preserved, and now not to not to place ourselves in the category of greatness of those those people, but to understand the challenge that we face. There's an attempt across the country to undermine our voting system by uh, suppressing the vote and nullifying uh, the results of elections. Uh, there is a, are attempts in Congress to do that as well. Uh, in Congress, we have two bills that have passed the House that are in the Senate, one to protect our vote and the other to um, expand the Voting Rights Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Uh, we're hoping that the Senate will pass these two pieces of legislation soon. A. B, this next week, Adam Schiff will have legislation protect our democracy, and it has a number of provisions that address just the concerns of that you raised, that we change from a democracy to an autocracy, or as you said, a worse a, a form of government, even than that. Uh, and so uh, this is our, we, are, we take an oath to protect and defend the Constitution. That is our responsibility, and that is what we intend to do. But as you said, any issues that we talk about, any legislation that we pass, none of it is as important as preserving our democracy to make good things happen for the people, for the children. Since it's geared to Congress, Jared, uh, Congressman Hoffman, did you want to speak to that as well? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I would only add that... Um, I share Patrick's concern, of course, about the, the threats to our democratic republic. And uh, earlier this year, on January 6th, we came closer to losing it than anyone uh, I know uh, ever thought possible. So the, the other important piece of this conversation is seeing through the important work of the January 6th Select Committee that Speaker Pelosi had the vision to put in place after our Republican colleagues unfortunately refused to join us in a uh, broadly bipartisan uh, special committee. Uh, we are making important progress on uh, just making sure the American people have the truth, that history has the truth so that we can be fully informed. Uh, but making sure that all of us, Patrick, you asked what can we each do uh, as we get that truth out, um, making sure that all of us uh, call out misinformation and untruths uh, because it's just deeply corrosive and threatening to our democracy. And you're quite right. We've been busy working on our legislation. As I often say, we can bake the pie, we can sell the pie. It's hard to do them both at once, uh, but the president uh, is committed to making sure uh, that the public is well aware of not only the uh, extent of the transformative historic nature of this legislation and what it means to people, but they know enough about it so they avail themselves of some of the provisions that will benefit them, whether they're a senior uh, getting lower prescription drug costs, uh, whether we still have to distribute, and that's part of our finishing up our work on the BBB on the Senate side is how we spend some, the rest of the prescription drug savings on our seniors. I didn't even go into that part of it, but it is a very important part of the BBB. So in any case, the um, thank you for your question. Yes, we have to get the word out. We're very proud of our president and his, the extent of his vision, the depth of his knowledge, 
uh, the commitment that he has to make sure that, it, that what we're doing is for the people that they know it and that they benefit of, from it. Nadine, uh, Nadine has been a, a champion for our children in every aspect of their lives, their, their uh, health, their education, the economic security of their families, healthy environments in which they can thrive and the rest. Nadine, uh, the well-being of the American people is the backbone of our democracy and the strength of our democracy. I didn't know if you want to speak to it from that perspective. Absolutely. When we, as a as a mother of four boys uh, myself, uh, when we look forward uh, to the world that our uh, children are going to grow up in, ensuring that there is uh, uh, representation and equity and inclusiveness all as part of the future that we envision for our children is absolutely critically important. So, uh, for that, I want to uh, thank you. Speaker Pelosi, uh, and Mr. Hoffman as well for your work in defending democracy. Thank you, Dr. Burkhan. Thank you. All right. Our next question is from Tim in San Francisco. Tim, you are on the live line to pose your question. Thank you guys for having me. Hello, Speaker Pelosi. Um, I'm calling from San Francisco up in Golden Gate Heights. And my question is uh, relating to climate change. Um, you know, we in California have a tradition and a history of being the most innovative uh, region in the world, uh, in particular the Bay Area. I'm wondering if uh, the, the Build Back Better um, plan has any language about uh, incentivizing and really leveraging um, the talent pool here in California, in particular, to tackle the problems uh, that are ahead in climate change, um, I think that we have a really unique opportunity to, um, you know, put the best and brightest um, from our state on this problem. Um, is there is there anything in, in this bill to incentivize that? And uh, tangentially related, I also wanted to ask for your support um, of new legislation that's going through in the NDAA. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand has actually written some uh, legislation that is, uh, like I said, tangentially related to this that I implore you um, and uh, the House to consider. Um, uh, and I, I know that's going to be coming to you guys soon. I think there's a similar bill um, coming through uh, the House. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you guys for taking my call. Thank you, Tim. Yes, and the legislation that you're talking about from Senator Gillibrand, we have our champion in the House and Congresswoman Jackie Spear, whom I had the pleasure, the honor of uh, sharing representation of San Francisco, but for her whole time in public life. She's been a champion for ending sexual harassment and, and, and uh, uh, all of the dangers to women in the workplace. As the chair of the Committee on Armed Services that deals with personnel issues, she has been a leader in stopping violence against women in the military. In terms of the uh, green uh, initiatives, um, I, I really our leader in California and in the country is Jared Hoffman. He's our go-to places. What do you think, Jared? Well, it's a great question, and, and I, I definitely think that uh, all the innovation in the Bay Area um, will benefit from the provisions in the Build Back Better Act. Uh, broadly, the incentives for renewable energy and energy efficiency are going to reward the companies and the innovators that they hire uh, who are successful and able to, to step in and do that work. But you know, we also have specific tax credits that um, go to carbon removal technology, some of which, you know, is still being invented and pioneered as we speak. Uh, so this is a forward-looking investment and in innovation. Uh, we've got green energy partnerships that are going to get new tax um, advantages, advantages that used to only uh, be provided to fossil fuel uh, partnerships. And so that levels the playing field for these innovators to get in there and, and do their good work. Um, and th there are a number of others, renewable fuels, uh, biodiesel, alternative fuels, lots of funding available, again, mainly through the tax code. But there's just a whole bunch of R&D and innovation uh, bound up in all of that. And, you know, as I uh, conclude this answer, let me just say Speaker Pelosi, honors me by uh, deferring to me on, on these questions about uh, some of the climate uh, matters, but she takes a backseat to no one on 
climate action and climate policy and leadership. I have seen that in the way she's helped steer this legislation uh, with a very slim a majority in the House um, over the threshold. And I've seen it at two global climate summits now where I've joined her. Uh, she is truly a great leader. And so for everyone on this call from San Francisco, you are fortunate to uh, have a, a climate leader second to none uh, as your representative. Well, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Hoffman, for your kind words. If I just may add to what you said, and yes, the intellectual resources that are available in our in our great state of California uh, will find partners in terms of entrepreneurship and uh, tax credits and the rest. But we also want to be able to train young people in apprenticeship programs and the rest uh, so that uh, some communities that have not previously been represented in this sector of our economy will have that opportunity. Workforce development in the green technologies in underserved areas is a, a equity, equity, equity is a very important part of it because we don't know what genius exists in, our, in our, our young people out there who haven't had the same opportunities as others, but we want to make sure that they do as, they, as we go forward. So I thank uh, Judy and John and Ryan and Kent and Leslie and Patrick and um, and Tim uh, for all of their questions. Uh, thank you for uh, to those who've responded to our other questions that uh, that uh, Dan Bernal put forth. Uh, with that, I'd like to yield to Dr. Nadine Burke Harris for any closing remarks you would like to make. Uh, just a, a final comment that we are at such a critical juncture. This is all connected, that when we meet our COVID, the COVID pandemic with science, integrity, and rigor, that improves our outcomes and our pandemic response, shapes our economic well-being, and that the climate crisis is also a health crisis. And so all of these things are connected and grateful to you, Speaker Pelosi, for your leadership in guiding us forward. Thank you so much. And thank you again for honoring us with your presence, informing us with your wisdom. And thank you. We're so grateful to you for your service and leadership as the Surgeon General of California. Uh, I give the last word to my colleague from California, uh, Congressman Jared Hoffman, Again, the go-to person in the Congress on these issues about saving the planet and, and protecting our environment, our species in every way. Derek Hoffman. Speaker Pelosi, I will just close by a, a little bit more context for the climate and clean energy provisions in the Build Back Better Act. Um, for those on this call that are concerned about gas prices, and this is certainly something that our colleagues across the aisle are talking about every day as if somehow the current high gas prices are because of Democrats or Joe Biden. Um, everyone on this call for their entire lives ha has been part of an economy where we were almost entirely dependent on the tender mercies of the fossil fuel industry to power a lot of our economy and almost all of our transportation. And so as we think about this fossil fuel roller coaster, which has always taken us into wild gyrations of prices and gouging adventures with uh, the fossil fuel. I call it the tyranny of the pump. Um, as we think about that, um, our answer can't be to just double down on that same fossil fuel roller coaster. At some point, we've got to get off the roller coaster. And the Build Back Better Act is our best chance in my life, certainly in the last century, I would say, to finally get off that dysfunctional roller coaster. We're going to give consumers a choice, uh, a way out of this tyranny of the pump, uh, because once you make that switch to affordable, reliable, clean electric vehicles, which we're going to help everybody do, um, you're not subject to those price gyrations when there's a war somewhere around the world, when there's an explosion or a spill or any of these other things that are so intrinsically volatile and disruptive in the fossil fuel industry. So I find that Truly exciting, uh, and also not just responsive to the climate crisis, but responsive to this dysfunctional consumer roller coaster uh, that the fossil fuel industry has brought us to. Thank you, Speaker Pelosi. Uh, thank you, Jared Huffman, for that very informative last word. And thank you all for joining us this evening uh, for our town hall meeting. 
hopefully we can have some are we allowed to have some in person uh soon but it, and so we do uh thank you all for for the, giving us the honor of your time this evening Thank you, Congresswoman Thanks. Pelosi. And before we close, we'll provide the response to the final poll question. Do you support allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices to lower the cost of prescription drugs to ensure that life-saving medications are available to all communities and people? Your response was 97% yes and 3% no. <laughs> thank, thank you again for joining Congresswoman Pelosi and her guest for today's telephone town hall. If you have a question that wasn't addressed during tonight's event, need assistance with a federal agency, or would like to leave a message for Congresswoman Pelosi and her staff, please stay on the line and you will be connected to voicemail. To receive email updates on Congresswoman Pelosi's work on behalf of San Franciscans in the Congress, please visit pelosi.house.gov and scroll down to sign up for the Pelosi update. This concludes tonight's event. Thank you again for participating and have a good rest of your evening.